All righty. Hello, everybody. It is so great to see you all. Um, welcome to Beyond Land Acknowledgement. This is a session as part of Face to Face 2022. Face to Face is made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature and by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. And this session is brought to you specifically by our very generous sponsor, LEAP NYC, which is hiring, just FYI. Um, my name is Kinsey Keck. I am the Programming and Membership Manager for the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. I am a white woman with chin-length brown hair. It's pulled up in a half ponytail this morning. I also have long brown bangs that touch the top of my my glasses, which are big and round and wire-framed. And I am wearing a cozy sweater that's white on the top and it goes down in multicolor blocks. Um, I'm sitting in my kitchen, which you can see behind me is a white wall with a few uh, art prints hanging behind me. Um, I just have a few reminders to get through before we get started. So if you are having trouble with Zoom at all, please feel free to send me or my colleague, Monisha Bayana, a private message. Uh, please do remember to keep your mic setting on mute unless you're the person speaking so we can hear everyone clearly. We encourage you to use the chat to ask questions and connect with other people on the call. I will collect resources from that and send them to you via email after the session. I also wanna note that this call includes closed captioning. You can turn that on by clicking live transcripts probably on your toolbar, probably on the bottom of your screen and clicking show subtitles. This call also includes live ASL interpretation and we will be spotlighting interpreters, but if you don't need that service and you want to see everyone in the space, I invite you to click the top right button uh, in, your, in your screen, it should say view, and there you can click gallery view and see everyone who is in the space. Uh, I also want to note that this event is being recorded. That recording will be made available on the Roundtable's website and YouTube channel. I will email you a link to that when it is ready. And that is it for me. It is my distinct pleasure to turn it over to our presenters for today. We have Pena Bonita, Chief Vincent Mann, and George Stonefish with us. I am going to spotlight them now and welcome to you all. We're so excited to have you here. Iha Kolomosi. Ninja Shinzi Kikai Man. Nunji Ai Lamawo Wanjikil Lamawo Tekwa. Anishi Kishalo Mokwen. Elamilian Yonkwai Kishkwik, Wak Kukuna Aki, Wak Tendao, Wak Mbi, Wak Matuk, Wak Yongo Mati, Wak Nimbu Mausawakanum, Anishik, 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 Anishik. Uh, how is everyone? Uh, my name is Chief Man. I come from the Ramapo Mountains, um, the Ramapo Turtle Clan. Uh, thank you, Creator for giving us today. Um, we thank you for giving us our Mother Earth, the fire and the water. We thank you for the trees and we thank you for all of our relations. Most importantly, we thank you for our lives. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Uh, let today be the day that we see the unseen that we hear the unheard, that we feel the unfelt, and that we love the unloved. Thank you. Oh, that was uh, Chief uh, Vincent Mann. He's the Turtle Clan Chief of the Ramapo, who are um, located just in Northern Jersey across the Hudson River from us. And my name is George Stonefish. And I'm a Lenape, but my uh, home territory is in Ontario, Canada, uh, in Southern Ontario, not too far from London. And we're the uh, Moravian town uh, uh, people of the Thames and about uh, 
40 miles up the Thames River north, there's another Lenape settlement, uh, Muncie. And um, you notice that we're talking about being located. We're federally recognized, both of us in Canada. Um, the Ramapo and also the Natico, which are the closest settlements of Lenape still in existence to New York State and to our original homeland, or even in our original homeland, because Jersey was part of our homeland too. Um, they managed to survive being here because they went and hid, went up into the mountains, or went into the, 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 the Southern Jersey area. There are other Lenape, but they're located in Oklahoma where there's two territories. One near Bartersville, Ontario, or Bartersville, um, Oklahoma, which is uh, located in the heart of the Cherokee territory. And then they have a, a settlement over by a, a, an Adarko in Oklahoma, which was just central Oklahoma. And then we have a, another group of Lenape that are federally recognized that are located uh, right next to the, um, um, uh, in, in, uh, in Wisconsin, next to the Menominee in northern, northern part of Wisconsin. You see, we're spread out all over the place. And when we talk about land acknowledgement, it's become a very important issue for us that's, that's, that's becoming more popular, which I'm glad to see because the bottom line is, even though I personally was raised here in this territory, I was raised in Manhattan. And my mother um, was from Raventown up in Ontario, and she never spoke English until she was about uh, seven, eight years old because she was raised by her grandparents up there and they didn't speak English. Um, her mother had to go to Detroit to get domestic uh, work, and to bring money in. And it wasn't until she was like seven or eight that she was brought down to join her in Detroit. And that's where she first came in contact with English and started to uh, speak it and eventually came uh, very versed in went to the best colleges in um, uh, Detroit for art. And um, she came to New York City in the 50s as a fashion model because she was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, beautiful, beyond compare. And she functioned as a, a fashion model here um, until she trans, she, she uh, went in and pursued her artistic skills because many of the artists that hired her to work encouraged her to do so. And she had been educated in art and she became one of the top high fashion commercial artists of the time here in New York City. And um, when she married my father, um, she eventually brought me here um, and I was raised in New York. Um, now, the thing is, what I like to talk about Lenape during our land acknowledgements is I like to, first of all, pose the question to everyone who's there after we do the small prayer. Now, the prayer that Chief Vincent Mann did, he did a very, very short version of how a prayer is done amongst our people during ceremony. If we were doing it correctly, the prayer would have lasted an hour, an hour and a half, and would have talked about all of our different brothers and sisters by name, the four-legged the four -legged creatures, the winged creatures, and uh, the, the, the sun, the, the thunder beings, the moon, the stars. All of these played important parts in our culture, and we looked at all of them as our brothers and sisters. We looked at the, the foliage and the, the greenery and the trees and the, and the, uh, the different uh, items that grow to provide sustenance for us. All of these would have been mentioned and we would give thanks for them continuing to follow their instructions as handed down by the creator. And it would go and go by section and section. Because for us doing a prayer and opening and acknowledgement, it is, in, it is imperative that we give thanks for all that has been provided for us 
and all that have decided to give up their, their life for our sustenance, for our clothing, for our shelter, because the, they were the instructions that were given to them by the creator. It's not like Genesis for us. Uh, first of all, um, this bounty on, on the back of uh, uh, the turtle, which we consider this continent being on, on the mother turtle, um, is imperative that you understand has been provided so that we could work together and provide uh, the ability to, to help each other. Whereas if you look at Genesis, you see that the Garden of Eden was given to was given to uh, uh, Adam for his bounty and for his control, just like the 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 woman was she brought out of his fourth rib, a dominant position for him and a subservient position for women. All of these go against our traditions because our traditions are based on a matriarchal structure where women have a great deal of position of power. They have political power because they are the ones that choose our chiefs and our councils for our different clans. Because contrary to Hollywood, we don't have hereditary chiefs, not in positions of power. Well, they get power because they have been selected by the elder women of the clan. And clans, you have to understand, are like the, uh, for lack of a, a better example, they're like the houses in Congress, the Senate and the representatives. And we have a minimum of three clans in each of our, uh, our little governments. And they can range from like with, with us, it's the turtle, the wolf, and uh, the snipe. And with that, it varies. But these clans are the controlling political power in our structures. And we sit in council in our clans and discuss things that are brought forth to the, to the benefit of the nation. And before they're decided, it has to be decided by the clan. And then it's passed to the other. That process continues until they both come to a meeting of minds an understanding of minds. And then it's passed to the third and last council last clan who has the power to send it back if he, they find it unacceptable or not for the benefit of the people. Now this type of political system may seem um, like you've heard of this before. Well, that's because we were the first democracy in this part of the world. We on this, our mother turtle were here to provide and protect all that surrounds us, all of our brothers and sisters. And you will also notice that in our prayers, we do not ask for anything. It is not in our way to ask for things from the creator because we have been provided with bounty here that surrounds us. We have been provided with everything that we need to have a life and therefore we should give thanks. And then, when you start talking about native people, you really have to understand certain things like, you know, when uh, they first came here, when um, we first saw the, uh, the arrival of these interlopers, these, these uh, people from, this, from outside of our continent come to our, our shores. Because we have a culture that's based on respect, for not only ourselves, but for our nuclear family, and in turn our clans, and in turn our nation. And then for the other nations that are part of our Confederacy, because the Lenape were comprised of many different groups that came. And we had many alliances that made us very st a strong force on the East Coast. I mean, you go out to Long Island, the uh, Shinnecock, and uh, the Canarsie out in Brooklyn, they were all allies to us. And our allies went, our territory started just below Albany and went all the way down the coast to the state of Delaware and in parts of New Jersey and uh, Pennsylvania. It was all our territories. And there were other nations that were 
they got what in us. I mean, because we had alliances with, if you go north, with the Pequot and the Mohegan and further up the Wampanoags. They were all part of us. They speak the same basic land, uh, language that we do, except they have different dialects for their particular areas because we were all united here. However, if you go to Midtown, 42nd Street, and you stand there and you ask the passerby, excuse me, do you know what native people were here when we arrived, meaning them, not us? They would look at you dumbfounded. No, but uh, they sold Manhattan for $24. That's all that they know. I mean, who were the Lenape? For most people in New York City or even in this East Coast, they have no idea that we are the ones that greeted and welcomed uh, the, the, uh, the Dutch and the English when they first came to these shores. We were the ones that provided them with initial sustenance because their stores after their long voyage had been depleted and they had no food. Without us providing them corn, beans, squash, the different fruits that are indigenous here, they would not have survived the first winters. Not to mention, they wouldn't have known what to do or how to prepare many of the things they came in contact with. Because mm -hmm. I know the Irish people here would say that what I'm saying is untrue, but we provided the potato, the sweet potato. I mean, there are many things that were found on Mother Earth or, or, or the Turtle Island here that were not found in Europe. And they had no ideas how to prepare them. Squash, avocados, we can go on tomatoes. The Italians wouldn't have had tomato sauce if it wasn't for us providing that ability to, for them to do it. Yet people negate the understandings of this. They don't address that. And when we talk, we, the purpose of doing land acknowledgement from my perspective is not to just acknowledge and to give thanks for all of us being here and coming together in one mind, but for the fact that people can recognize what we provided to all and in turn, how we were treated and how we were given thanks by the, the colonists that were here. Because eventually after they got a footing, and they started to get strong. They started to get jealous about our territories and our tribal areas because of our success. I mean, even the way that we planted, which was alien to them, of putting together the uh, three sisters, bean, corn, and squash, and growing them together. And those, those vegetables they had never seen. But by growing them together, one provided uh, protection against pestilence. One provided a stock for it to grow up on, and the other one provided the ability for them to, to mesh together. I mean, they all, they all contributed something to the process, and as a result, their product, their fruit, their vegetables, or what was provided, were larger than what you see today in the supermarkets, because this was the best way to grow things. It provided for everything and you didn't have to use all of these chemicals to, to protect it because it protected itself. It worked hand in hand with each other, which is the way native people have always looked at things. We look at nature and we learn that this is the way we are supposed to do. So when these people came in destitute, hungry, and, and came with their big boats, we provided them the ability to live. We showed them how to hunt. We showed them how to fish. And the things that we provided enabled them to survive and to get strong. And in turn, what they did is they went and they chased us from our territories all on the East Coast here. And they would come in and they would massacre our villages. And we would take off and we would leave and we would go to a new territory where we thought we would be safe and we would establish a new village. And then they would repeat the process. 
As for my people from Raventown, we were from this New York metropolitan area, but we ended up being chased all the way down to Oklahoma, all the way down through Kansas and all of this. And when we got there, we were found we weren't unwelcome and we were chased up this way again. And we ended up coming up through Ohio and Indiana, what is now Indiana, up into Michigan and crossed over at Michigan into Ontario and followed the Thames River up where we settled. And that was our final massacre. We were massacred there because we had left and we had brought with us Tecumseh, the warrior who was bringing native people together and they wanted to kill him. They massacred our village and they succeeded in killing him with our, in our territory. We have buried him, but we have not given up his, land, his burial spot because we believe it should be protected. And we know where he is, but we will not ever allow the non-natives to find out. Now, with this journey that we had, this dispossession that happened, it happened to, Numerous groups of Lenape. That's how you got the Lenape up in Wisconsin, the Lenape in Oklahoma, two groups there, the Lenape up in Canada, the two groups there, where all of this territory here is where we should be. The only ones who have managed to stay close to our areas are the Ramapo and the Nanako. And of course, the federal government, in their wisdom, have chosen not to recognize them as federally recognized tribes. They are state recognized because they have had the wherewithal to remain faithful to their beliefs and to their culture and to fight. And they're fighting for their recognition, which I know that they will receive because they're entitled to it and they have the lineage to prove that that it belongs to them and that this is their society. Now, my land acknowledgements are always different because I explained this after giving the acknowledgement and welcome to all of you and to explaining to you that I am your landlord. And as a result of that, I welcome you. And in doing so, in doing so, I try to educate people on who we are. And I'm very, very happy that this land acknowledgement thing has, has started to spread. I mean, myself and Chief Man, we do land acknowledgements for Columbia University for their graduations. Um, Chief Man does uh, land acknowledgements for NYU. Uh, we do them for St. Francis College. Uh, we do land acknowledgements at the UN and many different organizations such as this one here. And it's a very good thing because at least now, the knowledge of who we are and that we're here becomes known to all. And I think it's a good thing because it's a first step in really understanding the history of this country. I mean, we know that the interpretation of history goes to the victors. And that's why it's taught the way it is in school. And that's why our contributions are minimized. I mean, most Italians don't understand these days that you wouldn't have a tomato sauce or a pizza without us, without providing us the ability to show these crops and you guys being able to take them home. I mean, even the potato that was taken home and fed to the poor in Ireland until they had the famine. And then even then, the Choctaws went and donated $100,000 to Ireland to help feed the hungry and the poor. And in fact, in Ireland, it's taught in their schools that this has happened. And they have uh, statues to the Choctaw in Ireland as a result of this. But we don't know this. And I'll tell you, most Europeans know about Native history more than the average American does. And that was created by design because America wanted to create this belief that there's a strong country, that nothing would have happened without them. When in reality, in the beginning, they were weak, they were hungry, 
And if it wasn't for us, they would have never survived here. And if we were a different type of people, we might have massacred them when they arrived, but we didn't. We welcomed them with open arms. And even though we have been massacred, chased after all through the country for Indian people, oh my God, I got to cram for my life. Um, even though we have had to suffer the consequences of assimilation, the consequences, land theft, all of these things, we have managed to survive because of a concept that we all share in our and native people throughout Turtle Island. And it's that the concept of respect for ourselves and for all. When I was young, a young activist, and we were fighting against the federal government and state governments on our territory, and picking up arms to defend ourselves. I would ask the, the elders, why do we only pick up arms and protect ourselves on our territories? Why don't we take the battle to them? And they said, because that's not our way. Our way is to ensure the future of our children for several generations. We're not to go after them because they don't know how to live their lives. As long as we continue to follow our ways, that's our strength. And that's why there's a traditional movement among Native Americans throughout this country, where the original ways, our way of life, it's not a religion, it's a way of life that we follow. And, and our beliefs, our ceremonies, they differ from region to region, because when you think about it, how can you have a strawberry festival out in a desert. No, you would have and give thanks for pinyon nuts. And those things are there, indigenous to that area. So each of our different nations, you go all the way up to Oregon and Washington State, there's a heavy reliance on ceremonies for the salmon and for those things that provide sustenance for them in their area. Because we evolved in these areas. We didn't come here as the doctrine of discovery would have you believe. We're not here just before the arrival of the Europeans. This is where we evolved over time, over generations and generations that predate Christianity. We have been here and we have had our strength and we have had our democracy. Here when Europe was being put through all types of crisis with the Inquisition and the religious wars and all of these things and the battles amongst themselves. We were a people who believed in each other and who worked with each other with our alliances. And this is why we have continued to remain strong to be who we are. And we will continue to fight. Now, my time is up. <laughs> I am going to now pass this off to my brother, my little brother, Chief Vincent Mann. <clears throat> Anishi, thank you. Anish. Um, the story that uh, well, not the story, but the words that have um, been spoken into the wind by um, by George is um, I had to go off camera there for a moment because I needed to uh, wipe that salty water uh, from the corner of my eyes. And those are the memories that we carry, um, you know, from our past, you know, um, in the present time and then into the future. Uh, my presentation here will uh, cover, you know, uh, the Ramapo. It'll cover, you know, our Muncie um, territory um, that you heard George speak of. Um, it will take you through our Holocaust. It will take you through um, the current demise of the turtle clan at the hands of a corporation 
a town and a state. And then in the end, what we'll discuss will be the efforts that we've taken ourselves in the Turtle Clan to save our people um, and to provide not just for the Turtle Clan and the Ramapo uh, Muncie Nation, but also um, for those communities who um, suffer as well um, in food deserts and lack of healthy food and um, medicinal medicines. Um, slide two. So uh, historically speaking, um, the red circle uh, covers most of the area in which our Muncie ancestors um, lived in. Um, and you will see as well uh, the Unami speaking people um, who uh, spell Lenape, L-E-N-A-P-E, um, and we spell it L-U-N-A-A-P-E. And you can see um, that it was a very vast area. Um, many uh, history provides that there were, you know, uh, hundreds of Lenape um, tribes. And in reality, there was only one. Um, all of the names in which we have today can be um, referenced in uh, locations such as Mawa, Mawawe, or Tappan, or Hackensack, or Ramapo. And um, as history has shown, um, those Lenape people who carry the name Delaware in their name was because of Lord Delaware um, having uh, the Lenape Sipu, the, the river named after him, now known as the Delaware River. And so when you see that, you'll understand that when there was an uprival, uprisal of the, uh, our relatives living along the Delaware River, it was, you know, the Delaware Indians. Um, when it was the Ramapo, you know, living in that village, that town that carried that name, the Ramapo, uh, we became known as the Ramapo. Um, when the Hackensacks, right, the name of that village, and these were all names that were very descriptive of the place in which we lived. Um, Muncie people are not in our dialect, we are an L dialect, so Ramapo, the R, um, comes to us because the Dutch um, use the R instead of the L. And uh, there's even a land deed uh, with Katona on it where you can see the L is erased and replaced with an R. Uh, so we really would be uh, from the village of Lamawo, which would mean downward slanting uh, or the mountainous region. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this map is a rendering of a 1625. And as you can see in the inset, um, that that is what we now know as Connecticut. And you can see that the village um, of the Ramapo, the Ramapo village there was uh, quite large depicted, um, you know, by those little triangles. Um, the Siwanogs, you know, the Pagusset, the, um, all those other names that you see there are just names of our villages. But when the Europeans came here, they didn't have that concept and didn't speak our language. So they took the closest um, phonetic sound and applied those to us as those were our names. Uh, next slide. Um, Pontus, uh, sachem of many places, uh, 1640 deed states Sagamore of the Takwams, the Wakusu, and the Chapan. Now that again, um, those are names of areas. Those are names, those are town names. Those are village names that then became um, uh, names of our people uh, bestowed upon us by the Europeans, uh, the settlers. 
um, Panas uh, was actually um, the grandfather of uh, Katona, who, um, as you'll see, I believe in the next slide, um, Katona was the uh, sachem of the Ramapo. Um, yes, right, so 1680 hop deed and um, tap hands, we'll see there. Um, tap hands has many names. Tap hands, tap gao, tap house, tap yao, um, tap gao, uh, tap gao, um, tap hands was the son of Panas. He was Katona's uncle. Um, Penahe um, is also in Onyx. Um, we're also all related. And so the area in which you saw before in the red circle was all under um, one family. Um, father, grandfather, sons, brothers. Uh, next slide. So uh, coming a little bit forward in time, uh, we have made uh, many um, travels, you know, to uh, areas that the Ramapo have been um, recorded in, um, in colonial time. And uh, as you would read this, you know, um, this is from, uh, I believe, uh, Stanford. And um, they have now re-acknowledged, you know, that relationship between our ancestors and their ancestors and have welcomed us back, you know, so that we can move forward together um, into the future um, so that they can learn, you know, about us again from the people um, who have against all odds, you know, um, remained in our homelands. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so today, um, well, uh, in 1665, the Nichols, um, Governor Nichols uh, signed a treaty with our relatives who lived in Asopus, who became known as the Asopus Indians. Um, there were uh, many uh, tries at living in peace next to each other. And so this uh, actual treaty of 1665 was supposed to be renewed every single year. And uh, this treaty was only renewed 17 times um, until about five or six years ago when um, I took that upon myself uh, as well as other uh, Muncie people to renew this treaty between ourselves and the English and the Dutch. Um, and we do this every single year. Um, this year, I believe it will be in August and we will be uh, doing it in Kingston, which was the original capital of New York. Uh, next one, please. This is a rendering of, of that belt. And, um, uh, one second, sorry. This is a replica belt, um, which is that belt as well. It is held in possession by uh, Ulster County, who participates in this renewal every year. And la two years ago, we provided them with a deer hide as a gift in exchange and uh, they have begun to record on that deer hide every renewal that we have had um, including last year and including this next year and including the years and that will come um, in our next seven generations and beyond um, the importance of of this is the acknowledgement of not of a government, but of a people, where we acknowledged, you know, um, the responsibilities that were provide, or the inherent responsibility that was bestowed upon us by our Creator to be, you know, these peaceful people, the Muncie people, um, 
You know, we are caring, loving, giving um, as a testament to that in the uh, middle 1600s, um, uh, Underhill had come, who was English, had come to Manhattan and he joined the Dutch and he was hired as a mercenary. And he uh, took soldiers and came to one of our villages, one of our Ramapo villages um, in what is now known as Bedford, New York. The area was called Pound Ridge and they slaughtered 700 Ramapo. And even after um, that slaughtering of our people, our ancestors did not retaliate. Our ancestors went to Greenwich to their government and asked them why did they allow this to happen because we were existing in peace. And not for another 60 plus years was, was there any major wars that had broken out. And we still resided in that same space before moving back from where we originally resided, which is the Ramapo Mountains. Uh, next page, please. Uh, Ramapo Split Rock. Um, this is where Reverend Ford, um, back in the 1800s, he gave, uh, in the late 1800s, he gave testimony um, to bearing witness to our last uh, corn ceremony. Uh, Reverend Ford um, eventually um, left here in the States, Turtle Island, and he headed across the salty water to care for his father, uh, Re Reverend Ford, who um, had fell ill and was passing. And it wasn't until approximately uh, five or six years ago that um, we found the rest of his journey and he ended up in Syria um, and he built a boys school on a hillside in Aleppo. Uh, Aleppo, um, where this building was still standing uh, five or six years ago uh, on the top of this hill above the doorway um, had been inscribed Ramapo. Uh, all the way around the world. It was amazing for us to see that. Uh, that place became a refugium for all um, different types of nationalities and races through the years. Uh, next slide. Uh, 1923, um, they were dredging uh, Wittek Lake, uh, Wittek um, Lake and when they were dredging this, they were doing so to provide water to neighboring towns and cities as they began to, to grow and expand. And when they did so, um, there was these things that floated to the surface and it resembled Saragossa seaweed. And so the, um, uh, the Hay Foundation had came, uh, Smithsonian, to verify um, what this was, and they determined that these canoes belonged to the ancient tribe, the Ramapo, um, having been built out of an extinct cedar and being between 800 and 1,000 years old. Um, for those of you who are nearby, you can go to the Patterson Museum in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, and actually see one of these on display. Um, next slide. So uh, at the turn of the century, eugenics um, became very big. Um, and one of the things that they wanted to try to do is they wanted to learn or figure out how to breed the laziness, as they called us, uh, out of us. And they came up with 18 different ways to deal with the unwanted people, the Ramapo people of the, of the Ramapo Mountains. And in 1923, Margaret Sanger, who was the creator of Planned Parenthood, along with the Harrimans, Bushes, Fords, Rockefellers, and the like, um, they came up with 18 different, way, uh, 18 different ways to deal with us. And, but the number one way was by a public lethal gas chamber. This is documented. Um, it never came to fruition because of public outcry. Um, but what did come to fruition was that 
they had taken and created a uh, Indian boarding school called uh, Le Letchworth Village, where they had cut our children's hair and stripped them of their language and of their culture. And the young girls who were there, um, when they went to see the doctor, he was drawing their anatomy and eventually discovered how to sterilize and began to sterilize our women. Um, that again, uh, public outcry, once that became known, um, tried to revert that. Um, but in California, that began to really take off in a bad way. Um, Henry Goddard, who was the head of the Vineland Training School, a state school for New Jersey, he eventually, halfway through his career, had realized the detriment to the indigenous people that he had that he had played a part in, and spent the rest of his life trying to reverse the effects of his work uh, with eugenics. Um, there was a German Jewish scientist who was a part of this as well with the Vineland Training School who had left his wife and daughter here and traveled back to Germany. Unfortunately, during that time, Adolf Hitler um, began to do sweeps and to uh, you know, imprison the Jewish people. And he was picked up in this sweep and had offered um, to save his life. He had offered the study of eugenics to Adolf Hitler um, and his people. And what we know today was that what was founded on the Ramapo Muncie people, um, the original people, inhabitants of this land, was in fact uh, employed against um, the Jewish people who were slaughtered um, in gas catch, uh, concentration camps and gas chambers, um, mass murdering of, of those clan people. Um, the irony of it all is that when they were liberated um, by the likes of the United States and the French and others, um, many, many, many of them found their way to back to where this was created and have no knowledge of this really. Um, but these are all proven facts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Edward Lenick, he is a premier ar archaeologist in the Ramapo Mountains and has spent his lifetime um, proving, you know, the existence of the Ramapo um, in this space for 12,000 years um, in the exact same footprint. Um, he is an amazing man who walks with his humility. Um, next slide, please. As you can see again on this map in 1776, um, where you see Ramapo, and it has been spelled in many different ways as well. Um, in Robert Gramey's latest published book um, on the Muncie speaking people, there is a, a section where they show the gradient in, in gradient color gray of the land that had been just, we had been disposed of. But where you see that circle right there, that on his maps is in white. And the reason why that is in white is because we never ceded that land ever. There is no actual document of transference of land. Um, and that is where we still reside today. Um, next map. Uh, this right here is just an example of hundreds and hundreds of um, World War I draft cards where Ramapos um, have been listed as Indians. And um, as we all know, you know, percentage wise, Native Americans, indigenous people, um, by percentage, you know, we carry the bur most burden to protect this land. Uh, it has always been our inherent responsibility to do so. Uh, next one, please. So this brings us um, to modern time, um, starting in the 1960s, 
Um, we have the unbelievable designation of our core community in Ringwood um, being listed as a Superfund site, which occurred twice. Um, next page. This is the Turtle Clan of the Ramapo Lenape Nation. Uh, next page. So in this picture, um, our two aunties here are standing in front of a memorial and a testament to the lives lost. Behind them, um, you see this fence and that fence, um, while the EPA and the state of New Jersey and the town of Ringwood say that that fence is to uh, protect us from certain areas within our community um, that only we live in, from where the toxic waste from the Ford Motor Corporation uh, was dumped. Um, both of my aunties in this picture have since passed. Um, my auntie to the right, her entire family, um, her, herself, her son, are completely gone now. Um, next page. This is an example of dumping that was um, being done. As you can see, there's water in the forefront. There's actually a stream that was there um, that no longer exists. Um, but the Ford Motor Corporation in the 1960s bought the Ringwood Mine area. It was uh, 900 acres. And their plan was to, with the town of Ringwood, New Jersey, was to create a $50 million self-contained executive housing community and remove 1,100 Native Americans from the Turtle Clan out of their homeland. And when that failed uh, in 1964, Ford, two months later, um, began to dump their industrial waste from the uh, largest automobile manufacturing plant in North America, which was built in Mawa, New Jersey. Um, Ford, um, through their own testimony, in the 1970s um, testified that they were disposing of 16 million pounds of toxic cancer, life changing, life um, taking chemicals. Um, they were disposing of 16 million pounds every quarter amounting to 32 million tons a year. They dumped from 1964 to 1974. When we think about that, and we think about the notoriety of Love Canal and what was done there for the non-Indigenous people um, with buying of their homes and relocating those communities and doing a full remediation, that was only 23,000 tons of material that was kept in one place. This is 32 million tons times 10, which is 320 million tons of paint sludge that had been dispersed throughout our community and illegal dumps that the town had. Um, in the Peters Mine, which is 2,400 feet deep, 17 levels, our people, when they showed Peter Hausenclever in the 1700s, the iron ore coming out of the earth, uh, we didn't immediately uh, join them in um, creating these furnaces and smelting iron, but uh, most of our ancestors um, took part of creating charcoal um, for them to use for these furnaces. Um, eventually, our people did work those mines, but the importance of those mines and the importance of these people who had against all odds, right? Um, survived in their homeland and laid our hands upon the iron for the first 900 cannonballs of the Revolutionary War to the chains that were links that were built across, to go across the Hudson River to prevent the English from coming up it to every war from the Revolutionary War to World War I, the iron coming out of these mines being utilized and, and being produced by the hands of the Lenape people who, who stayed here to still defend this. The Ramapo 
one see people who are still denied, you know, that reaffirmation of being federally designated uh, nation. If it wasn't for our people, if it wasn't for us and our resiliency and our, our willingness to pay taxes in two states for 75 years to not be forced off our land, the United States would not be what it is today. You know, we took part of that. We sided with the rebels against the invaders, right? Which was Britain. Um, to the steel that holds the dome over the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., that houses both sides of the legislature, those who are supposed to acknowledge us, those who are supposed to protect us and write laws to do such, and yet fail. The Turtle Clan. Uh, next slide. Uh, there is a documentary that was created, Man versus Ford. It is worth watching, um, but you have to pay attention to our people, not so much the lawyers um, who seemingly um, pays more attention to. Next slide. Uh, and in the hands of my uncle here, that is a chunk of Ford paint sludge. In one of the areas which is being cleaned right now, uh, it's not being cleaned actually. There's three areas that are actively um, being manipulated to put caps over to leave within our community. And this one particular place called the O'Connor Disposal Area, the material in there was so toxic after being treated twice in Michigan, it went through the furnaces at high temperature. And after the second time, the Michigan people called the federal government and said, get everyone out of there now. This material is too toxic to be buried anywhere in the continental United States or U.S. territories. From our standpoint, this would be the second time that the United States invaded Canada. Uh, once was, uh, the first time was when they were chasing Tecumseh. Uh, the second time was when they took this material um, after being treated and not being able to be buried in the United States to Canada and dumped it across the street from the Chippewa Reservation, who now exhibits the same health ailments and cancers and deaths as our community. Uh, next slide, please. This is a picture looking out over um, the Wanaku Reservoir, which sits less than a mile from this Superfund site. Uh, all of the area in which our people live was designated by the Hewitt family as being protected forever in a land deed. Uh, that land deed was created in 1918 when the Wanakew Reservoir began to be built. This reservoir feeds nearly 6 million people every single day. It's less than a mile from this Superfund site. And all of the tributary streams from the Superfund site flow directly into it, carrying all this toxic material and waste for 57, 58 years. Uh, it's quite amazing to me that this is allowed to continue, but I carry the understanding of why. And the reason why this is allowed to be left in place, why our people are being forced to be kept in place, is because the town of Ringwood encouraged Ford and partnered with them. As a matter of fact, they even created the Ringwood Solid Waste Authority to allow Ford to dump this toxic waste in our community. In 1970 to 71, the state of New Jersey issued a permit dump this toxic material directly on our people. And if any of this was brought to the greater public and the greater knowledge into a federal court, where there was a jury who could sit there and decide whether or not those three entities, those four entities in Ford, New Jersey, the town of Ringwood and the EPA, to allow this, to allow this to happen to this water that provides life to even be at risk. 
you know, uh, it's beyond beyond me. And I would imagine that this would come to fruition, that this would be stopped. Um, you know, how, how we got to where we are is because, you know, the United States wasn't founded in Massachusetts when a pilgrim stepped off the boat. This was founded here in the cradle of life because at the end of the last ice age, this was the only place you could exist. That is why the Lenape people are known as the grandfathers because all descend from us, all the Algonquin speaking people. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, one of the things that Michaelina and I did was to create the Muncie Three Sisters uh, Medicinal Farm. We created this farm because nobody from I, any of the governments, no matter which they were, came to our assistance to try to help our people. So um, next slide, please. So about 30 miles away from the core area of the turtle clan, we decided that we were going to create a garden. Um, and we did a documentary with Rutgers University um, called The Meaning of the Seed. And when we look at a seed, that seed is alive. It is the same as a seed in a woman. Um, and then that seed, you know, um, gets pollinated and then when it cracks the soil it begins to crawl and then begins to walk and becomes a young adult you know like that human right and then when it becomes that adult in a later life you know it gives back to the people in the and then and in this instance in a vegetable it gives it back to us in the form of fruit and and um, vegetables and nuts and berries slide please this is uh you know a group of us who were out there planting ginseng and planting uh potatoes and uh our three sisters the corn and the bean and the squash and our fourth sister um the sunflower and the little brother the sweet potato uh next slide here on the left, we are planting garlic and we planted our garlic the first year by hand. On the left-hand side is a uh, descendant of an 800-year-old tobacco Lenape seed that was discovered in a satchel in a rock shelter not too far from our home. Um, from that, I was gifted a plant because I was entrusted with the most sacred of medicines and, and, and carry the understanding of where it needs to go. And so this is a beautiful example of um, our Lunape Muncie um, tobacco, which is the closest thing we have to our creator. Next slide. Uh, here we are, uh, this is a high tunnel that was, um, funds were raised and it was the first high tunnel we put up. So we could extend our growing time and on the right, um, we are harvesting our first potatoes and the expressions on the face are just a total amazement. Um, it is one of my favorite vegetables to unearth, um, you know, where you pull back the soil, you know, pull back the cover of our mother earth and receive that bounty, you know, um, is amazing. Uh, next slide. And that is it. So um, I appreciate um, being given this time to um, give some insight to the people who um, are many, um, who have against all odds, again, um, resisted colonization, who um, still live every day as indigenous people. Uh, in a, um, uh, a land, you know, that is still occupied. So, Anishik, thank you. Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the fact that I am coming from you, to you, from the William Jennings Art Gallery, which is in Manhattan, 
on 2nd Street between Avenue B and Avenue C. This is an art gallery run by uh, Cora Jennings and Cantalba. Um, they have often showed American Indian art, which is probably the only gallery in New York City that has been consistently friendly and supportive. Um, so if you get a chance, come here, enjoy. It's a great little space. Um, right now, they have this beautiful show. This is two of the announcements. Uh, it's called Magnificent Motown, Art Inspired by Music. So come visit. Um, a lot has been said about the last 400 years, okay? And I'm not gonna be one to argue with it. I'm gonna support it. Because um, over the last 400 years, the dominant white culture has arrogantly attempted to crush the lives of Indian people. Um, they rendered many tribes extinct through brutal war and government policies. Uh, today, Indian people still struggle in order to survive, uh, battling against forces that have dealt uh, lowest educational opportunities, the lowest income levels, the lowest standards of health, the lowest housing conditions, the lowest political representation, and the highest mortality rates in America. Even as these grave hardships exist for the living Indian people, a mockery is made of us by reducing our tribal names and images to the level of ins insulting sports team mascots, brand names for automobiles and camping equipment, names of various uh, other commercial products produced by dominant white culture. This strange white custom is particularly insulting when you consider the lack of attention that is given to real Indian concerns. The words mascots, machines, cities, products, and buildings are symbolic of the cool and uncaring attitude that the majority of American feel, Americans feel towards the serious crisis that faces American Indians daily. Okay. Uh, I've chosen to show several different artists from several different fields, uh, poetry, and uh, there's many uh, pottery and all the other musicians and actors and different forms of art that I would love to bring you. I can't bring you everybody. I uh, just want to mention a few. Okay. Uh, one of my favorites is a Cheyenne artist from Oklahoma who had a display in Times Square uh, at one point, lights were going across that had a Cheyenne word on it. And he said, we don't want Indians, just their names, mascots, machines, cities, products, buildings from the living people. Okay. So, give you a little Cheyenne word. <laughs> um, one of my favorite artists is T.C. Cannon. This is his work right here. T.C. Cannon says, an Indian painting is any painting done by an Indian. Today, I don't really think there's such thing as Indian painting. There's so many modes that people are working in that it seems beside the point to call a painting Indian just because an artist is an Indian. People don't call a work by Picasso a Spanish painting. They call it a Picasso. After all, Picasso spent most of his life in France. Does that make him a Spanish painter or a French painter? It makes him a Picasso. So that's kind of where we're coming from too. Um, one of his favorite poets was Joy Harjo. I'll read you one of her pieces. She is a poet laureate three years ago. Okay. Joyce Bourbon and Blues for T.C. Cannon. 
We were wild then. We emerged from bloody history, sent off to Indian school, into the white clothes of pious religion and rules that learned to forget our mothers, fathers, and grandparents who loved and loved us. When we arrived, we were in the embrace of the God of the plains, horses, and where sky and earth meet. And every day was a prairie song. Every word and act had import into the meaning of why we were here as spirits dressed in earth. We were wild then, they said, because we spoke a different language and would not give over our spirits of many colors. And although they tried, they could not make us, no matter how hard they drilled and forced us. We died over and over again in those stiff desks as our hearts walked home. We sat outside our dorm rooms on cold winter nights and made plans to escape history. We were wild then. We didn't take it well. Mine imprisonment gave way to visions. Our dreams could not be confined by the walls of institutional green of misbegotten bureaucracy. We found alcohol, smoke, and anything else to break us through to the other side, where our visions shivered there, near the hills outside the campuses, waiting for us to recover from the sickness of forgetness. Kind of heavy, huh? We also have Diane Burns. Diane passed away at the age of 50. This is a photograph I did of her. Okay. She was a great poet. She wrote Riding and the One Eyed Ford. Okay. She says, Our people slit open the badger to see tomorrow in its blood. Now look at me and see what our tomorrows hold. We lie together, souls slit open, raw and bleeding. We embrace and rub the wounds together. Okay. All right. I guess T.C. Cannon, Diane Young, he was a vet in a car crash. And then we have people whose careers died. This is Sashin Littlefeather. Sashin went on an errand for Marlon Brando. She went to refuse his Academy Award on the Oscar night. And John Wayne had to be held back by the guards that night. He was going to go on stage and drag her off because she made a speech explaining why Marlon Brando was not accepting the Academy Award. And it was his protest for, about the treatment of the American Indians. Because of her involvement, she never again was ever given a chance to audition for a movie role. She was created by her and she never got another job in the movies. And we have, this is my work. Our people, our land, our images, international indigenous photography. It was kind of a su surprise, I think, when we started showing our photography. Um, Canadians were more receptive than the Americans. Um, they actually support a lot of different art a lot more than this country does. Um, I've had some shows up there and had them bring me up and treat me like, a, like an artist that was um, a valuable contributor. Some of my art is personal. This is my brother as he's lifting a canoe and I took a photograph of him. And then this was published in support of Native Americans. Um, 
one of my favorite artists, it's always been R.C. Gorman. If you go to New Mexico, you'll see a lot of his art. He lived in Taos, he's a Navajo. Um, he passed away, but his art is still available. And he pre predominantly, his work is about women. Okay, the Navajo women. Um, some of my work is about Mother Nature. This is one I did that was shown out at Governor's Island about the, the whole summer, as a matter of fact. Let me talk about Governor's Island. Governor's Island is giving Native Americans uh, a visitation practically on that land. What they offer is a no broken down house that they want us to put money into to fix it up. Uh, so that the tourists from all over the countries, uh, not of this country so much, but from Europe and the Orient come to visit. And they say, you know, they're like giving us this big spiel about how wonderful they are and offering us this place to have during the day they are only open from morning to evening so there's no visitation at night there's nothing after six o'clock you got to get off the island and let me also remark about the fact that this used to be a um home for the military and once the military left Governor's Island, the state of New York took it over. They literally have buildings out there by the dozens that have hundreds of vacant apartments. And yet you got people on the street in New York City who have absolutely nowhere to go, no chance to get a home, have to go through all kinds of bureaucratic nonsense and then wind up on some list in some shelter. In the meantime, they have this lush place out there, just sitting there for years. So that's my little spiel about, I really think they should either give it back to the Indians or at least put homeless people out there. It is horrendous to go out there and see all of these vacant apartments just sitting there. The guy says to me, well, you know, you're kind of lucky to get this place for the summer for you guys. I said, no, you're lucky to have Indians. And he had to admit that I was right. Okay. Did I read this? Okay. A few years ago, I had done this about the automobile, okay? When Indians have automobiles and you go somewhere, nine times out of 10, it's an old model. It's gonna break down. So Indians are pretty good mechanics. So you might get there without a problem and you, but probably you're going to have a problem and you better know how to fix the car. So we're all for electrical cars. We're all for getting rid of gasoline cars. Some of my work is about my family. Okay. This is called The Littlest Trapper on 7th Street. Okay. Some of my friends also get into my artwork because I do a little poetry too. And this is about a Navajo friend of mine. She was an elder and she wanted to live in Albuquerque. She was living on the reservation in Arizona at the time. Okay, so she sat in hot sunlight, small, brown, wrinkled, folded, quiet, hands picking lint from a purple, velvet skirt. I want to live in Albuquerque. 
Those Navajo women steal all my knives. It's okay, steal a little turquoise jewelry. They really need money. I raised rubber plant in desert. It was hard to do. Their man stole it. I wanna live across the street from Albuquerque Zoo. I steal big ostrich eggs. They make big meals, fill a whole pan, enough for two days. Tastes good too with green chilies. Those Navajos steal, you know they do. <laughs> so it's not that we don't have a sense of humor. We have to have, never be able to put up with it. Okay. Um, one of the persons I wanted to talk about too is Buffy St. Marie. Buffy is a, a songwriter who in her career was banned from the radio and from uh, participating in a lot of musical uh, adventures by Nixon. And he, she, she is amazing. She's now 80 years old and she won the Academy Award at one point for her music. And this is the words of one of her songs. Blood runs redder than jeans paled from Grand Canyon Caverns to the Karen Sad Hills, wounded, the losers, the robbed, sang their tale, Los Angeles County to New York, the white nation fattens, while others grow lean. Oh, tricked and evicted, they know what I mean. My country, tis of thy people, you are dying. The past just crumbled, the future just threatened. Our life's blood shut up in chemical tanks. Now here you come, bill of sale in hand. Surprise in your eyes that we lack thanks with the blessing of civilization you brought us, lessons you taught us, ruin you wrought us. Oh, see what? Trust in America has brought us. My country, tis of thy people, you are dying. Now our own chosen way is a novelty. Hands on our hearts, we salute your victory. Choke gone, blue, white, and scarlet hypocrisy. Pitying blindness that you've never seen. The eagles of war whose wings you lent you glory were never more than clarion crows, pushed wrens from their nest and stole eggs and changed their story. The mockingbird sings it, it all she knows, what can I do? Says a powerless you with a lump in your throat and a tear in your eye. Can't you see their poverty profiting you? My country, tis of Thy people, you are dying. What to say after that? <laughs> Buffy wrote about iron workers. She has a song called Skywalker. He's a friend of mine. Um, I took pictures of iron workers. Up here, I can show this to you a little better. This, I think. This is a young man who, his story is pretty typical. He was adopted at a very, very early age and He's Apache, he was brought to New York and raised on Governor's Island, as a matter of fact, by a military family. Um, Noel, he learned welding and he did that his trade for a while. Noel's adopted father raped him when he was 11. Um, 
Noel tried to commit suicide at 15 and wound up doing some drugs and was killed in a car crash. Okay. This is Noel. Okay. Uh, did I read you? Yeah, I read that. Okay. This is a statement by a woman who is very supportive of Native uh, work and runs a organization called Amarinda. Okay, it says, what defining elements ties American Indian visual artists together with their very expensive experiences and approaches to self-expression. Much like any member of mainstream society, individual Native American Indians cannot be compartmentalized based on simple means. With one of the most complicated histories since the dawning of mankind, the cause and effects produce a rich enough history to write innumerable volumes of scholarly texts, then raise the curtain. What makes Indian art, images applied to canvas, stories molded into clay or conjured from driftwood, the arrangement of earthly elements reveal personal journeys. To better understand the present, directional journeys of such a diverse community of American Indian audience, the significance of history must be established. One of the things that I get constantly from people is that, well, my ancestors didn't go through that. They only came here after World War II. Okay, but let me ask you this. If you had a diamond ring or a piece of jewelry that was fantastically gorgeous offered to you and you knew it was stolen, would you be breaking the law if you went ahead and bought it? I think so. I think so. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? All right. Um, yes, we can. I'd like to say thank you to uh, everybody who participated, Ben Penna and uh, Chief Mann. And wait, to wait, all wait. Who are, to huh? I didn't get to introduce my helper, Nick. Oh, okay. Nick. okay. Nick is an actor who will be performing at La Mama in June. So please watch for Safe Harbors and his production, okay? Go see Nick. Yeah, go see Nick. <laughs> I enjoy his performances. And I'd like to end today's uh, thing with an honor song to all of you here, all right?
Uh, thank you for having us. And it was really great to um, be a member of uh, this pro, uh, pro, uh, pro production. I, uh, I didn't know I didn't have my uh, <laughs> thing on. Anyway, thank you very much. And um, any questions? I think folks, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, but I do recognize we are getting over time. I just wanna say thank you so much on behalf of everyone here to George, to Chief Mann and to Penna for sharing your artistry, your expertise, your stories and your experiences with us. We are so grateful to you all. And I wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us today. I also am gonna launch just a quick three question poll, same one that we do at the end of each of our sessions. So if you have a moment or two, please do um, answer the, the poll so that we can get your feedback for the, today's session. I also want to invite you all please to join us for our second session which is later today um, at 4 p.m. You should have received the link already in the same email for, um, for which you received this link. And the next session today at 4 p.m. is Queer Liberation in the Classroom. We hope to see you there. I also just wanna remind everybody on the call that um, the round table is hosting a 2022 Arts and Education Job Fair that is in partnership with the Borough of Manhattan Community College and Community Word Project. So I'm going to put a link in the chat for you to access more information on that and to register. And I'm just going to look in the chat. I hope that our presenters see how much gratitude and love has been written in here. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Just scroll through to make sure. Alrighty then I think that I, we're safe to close this session out. So thank you again so much to our presenters and to you all for joining us. I'm gonna end the poll now and close this meeting and have a lovely day. Hope to see you soon.